I want to start, Mitch, by talking about um, when we had the storm, the question was, do we rebuild or do we just leapfrog ahead and try to make it better? And uh, in many cases, I think we've come back better than we were before the storm. Would you agree? I, I would. But before, I want to, can I thank you for asking me to come here? Yes, please. And everything. Excusively, <laughs> I hope. I, I, I love being here. I'm, I'm thrilled to be with all of you. And really, Walter was one of the f first people that came back and helped rebuild um, the city of New Orleans on our recovery authority. He had a lot of other stuff to do. So, I mean, I'm, I'm forever indebted to you. So thank you very much. And thank for all of you in here, Marvin, um, Walter alluded to Shell. One of the one of the amazing initial stories right after the storm hit. Everybody was in you know difficult state. Nobody knew what to do. Everybody was emotional. Uh, not surprisingly, in retrospect, although very surprisingly at the time, the people that really stood up first were the musicians, and everybody kind of gasped at the possibility that we would lose our culture. You know, oh my God, something is going to disappear. And so musicians started having having uh, fundraisers, and we had one at Lincoln Center like a couple of weeks after the storm, and. Uh, Quint Davis was there, and one of the things we were all concerned about was whether or not Jazz Fest was going to come back. And people said, y'all are crazy. Why do you want to bring the Jazz Festival back? You've got more important things to do. And I think people said, listen, that is representative of our culture. It's very representative of the soul of New Orleans. And if that didn't come back, it was going to be a symbol that New Orleans maybe was given up. And Shell stepped up to the plate in a very, very difficult environment uh, and became its primary sponsor. And if it wasn't for you guys, that festival wouldn't be there. 400,000 people came this year. Bruce Springsteen was the headliner. Largest festival we ever had. It's a, got a half a billion dollar economic impact. 800 small businesses work there, so it's an amazing thing. So I thank you for that. Thank, thank you, you very much. And Gloria so, did us help do it too. Gloria, Gloria. there's a, everybody, there's a whole bunch of people in this room. So that was spectacular. But on, on this essential question, it's really a, it's really something we're thinking a lot about, um, because not every, not every community, society, uh, or place will, will have a cataclysmic event like Katrina, a near-death experience, it makes you stop for a second and think about where you've been and where you're going, and which is one of the unfortunate things, that we don't do that more often and we wait until there's a catastrophe, but that happened to us. And there are a couple of things that you learn when you watch people in, uh, in agony. Um, and many of you know this, because you've had sickness in your family, if you had something bad happen. You know, when you have near-death experiences, your mind gets clear really quickly. And decisions that seem hard before don't seem so hard again. But it's interesting to watch what people's tendencies are. One of the things that I learned in, when we were rescuing people was that whatever, whatever differences people had, white, black, Republican, Democrat, they all disappeared because there was one boat, literally, and everybody had to get in the boat. And all of a sudden, people found common ground really quickly, not just around that, but a bunch of other stuff. And it was kind of interesting to watch that. And I think that that's really kind of a symbol of what's happened. Another thing that happened, uh, we were rescuing a lady in the Ninth Ward. And uh, she had lost everything. The houses were 18 feet underwater. They were turned around. People that had clothes on, had a T-shirt or shorts on, and whatever clothes they had might have been in a plastic bag. They were drenched. And that's all they had, American citizens. But there was this one lady who was holding a clock. It's true. And, and plus, New Orleans never lose their sense of humor, no matter how bad <laughs> things get. I mean, truly. And so she's holding a clock. And so this is the way we talk in New Orleans. I said, hey, babe. I said, why are you holding that clock? She said, darling. She said, I done lost everything. And I don't know nothing, except I know what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, wait. now, besides being hysterical, I want you to think about, I want you to think about that. She wanted to grab something and have something that she knew and that made her feel secure. And as crazy as it sounds, that one thing made her feel secure. And so when, when that kind of thought went into, okay, what are we going to do now, right? We're going to drain the water out of the city. Now we've got to fix everything. Um, the question got to be, are we going to put it back like it was? And so you know more about this than anybody else, Walter, because you started the discussion about education. We had a really bad, Katrina didn't cause all of our problems. We had a lot of stuff that started happening a long time ago. And it helped us, Professor Arnstein, how are you? Nice to see you. My freshman college teacher. <laughs> Norm, you didn't teach me very much. Never made it to Congress. Couldn't get there if I wanted to. So in any event, we, we were thinking about when New Orleans started getting bad and what we needed to do to get better. The, the immediate and the smartest thing would have been, for example, to rebuild Wilson Elementary School, which is a school five blocks from my house and about four from Walter's. 
which Walter has taken a great interest in, in a place in New Orleans called Broadmoor, which is our neighborhood. Um, FEMA wanted to give us money to put it back, and they had an obligation to. And so the real easy question was, well, how much damage does the school have, and why don't we just go put it back like it was? And then people said, well, wait a minute. But like it was was bad, so why don't we make it into something that we always wanted it to be? And hence the theory of rebuilding New Orleans was born in that very place where we said, well, what if we imagined a school system the way it should be? And why don't we build towards that? And so New Orleans has, for the most part, adopted that attitude. Now, this is fraught with very difficult cultural mores because New Orleans, as you know, is a very authentic, historic place. And we don't change very easily, even though we know we're doing some things poorly. We kind of get comfortable in our dysfunction from time to time, um, and, and, and which distinguishes us in, in some ways from many cities. And so we have had to kind of conceptualize building the city that we want to become. And that has taken us in a uh, very, very different direction than most other cities in America are going today and from where we have been. And the school system, which you have been a part of, is a, is a real life example of that. So in New Orleans, we decided, um, because we had the opportunity, because the school kind of created, I mean, the storm kind of created this thing, and we had to do something with it. But people don't like that word opportunity because it, it, it kind of predomits that somebody's going to come in and take advantage of somebody that had something and take it and make it their opportunity. So we call it a responsibility to do the most important thing that everybody said, which is to rebuild the school system. And so now we have, don't have a school system anymore that was centralized. We used to have an Arlington Parish school board. It ran everything. The head of the school board and the school system decided what principals went where. They decided what principals, who they hired and fired. It was fraught with corruption. It was fraught with a bunch of stuff. And Katrina happened right at the time when the charter school movement was moving forward. So all the stuff Michelle was doing in Washington, D.C., and Joe Klein was doing in New York, we started doing, but we had the chance to do it astronomically faster and more forward because now the state had taken the school system and it had created an autocratic governing structure where somebody like Paul Ballas could come in and say, this is what we're going to do. The consequence of that has been over the last five years, we, ha we now have... Uh, more physically, more charter schools than any other place um, in America, and 80 to 85 percent of our kids go to charter schools. And it appears from most of the testing data that the gap, the achievement gap between poor kids in the inner city and other kids is closing very fast. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what that looks like. Now, that wouldn't have been that way if the philosophy would have been to put it back like it was. And on top of that, because of that philosophy, we have been able to convince FEMA and Senator Landry handled the congressional legislation. It actually did take an act of Congress to give FEMA the ability to give us money in a lump sum so that we could then make smart decisions and plan where the schools were going to go and what they were going to look like and not just put the plaster of Paris back in Wilson Elementary School like it was before the storm. And so we are going to now rebuild physically every school in the city of New Orleans or rehab one, and almost all of the kids in New Orleans in the next couple of years will be in charter schools that are improving. But charter schools are not necessarily the answer. They're good charter schools and bad charter schools. One of the things that happened, is you talk about the Wilson School in our neighborhood, the Wilson School became independent and chartered, but it had to compete with that school off Ferret Street where Alice Waters has got her little garden in the back. That's right. And the Kip Green. Academy and down, the Kip yeah, Academy. the Green School, whatever. And so kids who grew up in our neighborhood now have the choice of different schools. And it seems to me that it's not the charterness, but the fact that if the school screws up, the parent moves the kid out of yes, the school. Yes, th thank you for correcting me about that. It's a, it's a very important distinction in the debate about school reform in our country. Is a public, they always say, is it public or is it charter? Well, charter schools are public schools, first of all. But is it a centralized school board management, or is it a decentralized charter school management, or is it a parochial school that the archbishop runs, maybe? And I think, the, I think for those of us that are not just cheerleaders for charter schools, I think that most experts who have followed this would say, whether it's ch public charter or public school board or parochial, if you find these following principles that govern how the school operates, principal autonomy, to be able to make hire and firing decisions based on who's good and who's not is one of them, um, auto financial autonomy, but the appropriate level of support, uh, choice so that parents and kids can choose and schools can compete and then some way to measure some really good objective measurements that are fair for everybody and then great teachers. If you have those five things, then you generally have a school that's producing a better result than the model that we had before. And um, 
that, that's kind of what's playing out. I expect that some charter schools are not going to do well, and they ought to get shut down right away. So there's got to be an accountability measure in place. Um, and I don't think people ought to get trapped in the charter versus everything else. It's just those principles that are important. In other words, not a centralized authority that tells everybody on the ground what to do. Great principles, great teachers, parental choice will get you a better school. Yeah, I mean, if you, uh, you, know, you have Rouse's and you have A&P or whatever, New Orleans, and they compete as grocery stores, and all of a sudden one of them stays open later in the evening, they do better. And when we had that competition, the schools started staying open a little bit later in the right. evenings, right? Well, one of the things that, um, and my wife Cheryl sitting in the front row, mother of our five children, and William, my 12-year-old, um, we, we, we have firsthand experience because he went to a school called Lusher uh, Elementary until last year, which is one of the great uh, public charter schools in the city. Kathy Reidlinger is the president of it, does a magnificent job. But they were able, because of their community, in partnership with Tulane, to create after-school programs, and so we call that enrichment now. But most of the schools do not have that. They lack that. Those that are able to do that after school and before school begin to produce a better result. But then you get into the issue of financing. So um, it's not unusual for, for Cheryl to say, I met with some folks, and they don't have after school programming. And that's the next, that's the next big thing. You have these kids uh, not only working in Teach for AmeriCorps, but for example, City Year and AmeriCorps that want to find a way to get into the schools and do enrichment programs, but we haven't found the financial mechanism to pay the $30,000 or the $40,000 stipend that they require. I can tell you, it is, it is incredible the work that they do uh, with young kids in the afternoons or teenagers, for example, that are thinking about going to school, going to college, how to prepare them for the SAT or the ACT. And so those kind of things are building up, but at the end of the day, it does come to management, and resources are a really important part of it. And I don't think that we have it right yet, I think we're heading there. I think we have a really long way to go because as, as well as New Orleans is doing, we were really far behind. You and know, uh, I do think one of the ideas that come out of this conference right now that a lot of us are dedicating ourselves to is the 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. hours in America are really a mess. And whether it be college track, city year, whatever, there are people trying to do that. But we should all dedicate ourselves. So can I make you, your heart hurt? Um, in New Orleans, in Louisiana, I'm sorry, in the, in the nation last year, about 7,000 young black men were killed on the streets of America um, by other young black men. Um, when you look at that, those statistics, what you find is the kids that are killing and the kids that are being killed have a common denominator. They dropped out of school, and they don't have their GED. When you kind of reach back into that, it means that we didn't identify these kids early enough, and we didn't, we didn't get them not only early, zero to three, but in the morning, right, for, or keep them in the afternoon and have meaningful things for them to do. It is also true that they came from very difficult families, broken families, babies having babies, a lot of that stuff going on. But the enrichment piece, whether it's done by the schools or in the recreation department or in a combination thereof, are both important. One of the things I'm trying to do with the school system, which is the charter school system is responding better to me than the regular school system, we have both of them, is we, we are with Sean Donovan and working on what I call place-based development. And this is kind of simple, and everybody knows this. We had it when we were kids. There was a school, right? And then the health clinic was somewhere around, then the police station was somewhere close, then the able to get on the streetcar or the bus was someplace close. It was a place. Well, what happened was Katrina beat everything to hell. The federal government starts sending money down, and the states lays money on top of it. We send our bond issues. All the money's got to get to the place at the same time so we can rebuild the neighborhood. And so one of the things I've done with the schools is said, look, if the city owns a piece of property that's next to a school, I want to give it to you. If it's a record, if it's a NARD playground, I want to give it to you so that you can have a lot more space. So for those of you that are not from New Orleans, you won't know these references, but you'll know Newman School. Newman's a wealthy school on Jefferson Avenue. Newman was able through um, raising money to raise enough money to buy a couple of houses in the block. They got the city to close the street, right? And now they have another whole block and they opened it up and they have a football field, a baseball field and all the accoutrements that produce some of the smartest, brightest people that go on to do great things in the world. Trinity has the same thing. Jesuit High School, where I went, has the same thing. Every public school in New Orleans ought to have access to that. And those public schools ought to be partnering with the New Orleans Recreation Department and controlling those spaces. And so we're trying to, to create this synergy. Now, I don't run the schools in New Orleans. So you were asking a little bit earlier about mayoral control. You don't necessarily have to have control in order to have cooperation. 
but you do have to have two willing partners who kind of see the end game and the mission. And we're making some headway with that as well. How are you working with Bobby Jindal? Is he going a bridge too far on the vouchers turning? Well, I just criticized him on national TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's not That's true. why your phone was The governor right and I, you know, you see Cory Booker and, and, uh, and what's the governor's name from New Jersey? Chris Christie. I'm uh, Yeah, joking. I'm okay. <laughs> Corey, Corey, <laughs> Corey and Chris are, one's a Republican, one's a Democrat. They're different philosophically. But what they've decided to do is, on most things, to find common ground and to minimize the things they fight about. Mm -hmm. My relationship with my governor is pretty much the same. Bobby and I both are reformers. And in Louisiana, that means a lot. Mm -hmm. So in other words, both of us have said the old corrupt practices of the past, the old okie doke doesn't have a place anymore. And he and I are like simpatico on that. We're both reformers as it relates to um, reorganizing systems of government to produce a better result for less money. Um, but he's decidedly more conservative than I am um, on a lot of stuff. But as the mayor of the city of New Orleans, I made a purposeful choice. And I think as the governor, he's made a purposeful choice for us to focus on the things that we have in common and to spend all of our time on that. As a matter of fact, today is the first time that I've ever contradicted him um, on health care policy. They asked him whether or not he was going to expand Medicaid in the state of Louisiana. He said he wasn't. I think that's a mistake. The reason I think that's a mistake, and I understand his position, um, is that we have a huge number of, uh, of individuals that are uninsured and underinsured in Louisiana. And the consequence to the taxpayer is much greater than they were on Medicaid. The, the math is pretty easy, and this is a little parochial. But if you're on Medicaid and the federal government's picking up 80 cents, and the state's only paying 20, that's a hell of a lot better than paying 100% when somebody has to go to the emergency room and sit there for 13 hours in charity hospital. We have to pay 100% of the bill. Um, and so you're not gonna, the poor people are not leaving Louisiana. We can grow out of poverty, but in the meantime, when we have that level of it and the mortality rates from catastrophic diseases in, New Orleans, in Louisiana is higher than anywhere else in the nation, it seems to me that getting on the front end of that stuff is better. On top of that, one of the major concerns I have, notwithstanding the fact that the governor may have disagreed with um, the, 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 the decision of the Supreme Court is it is what it is. And that system is in place unless and until this presidential election changes it. Now, maybe what the governor meant was I'm not going to do it and I'm going to wait for the presidential election. And then if um, Mitt Romney is elected president and they undo Obamacare, then that might be a reasonable decision based on the new model that we're going to put in place. But if the, um, the Affordable Care Act is going to stay in place, the only way to get that down to the ground and to, and to actually make it work is to expand Medicaid coverage. If not, what happens is you leave a lot of people sitting in emergency rooms that otherwise would be able to pick and choose their hospitals and bring down health care. So it's not, a, it's not a major fight. It is somewhat of a difference of opinion. On um, schools, though, the governor and I see, see things very much the same way. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the city of New Orleans really is, from a reform perspective, leading the nation about how to move to a more decentralized um, program of events. But I would, in historical perspective, say that the debate used to be about vouchers and public schools. It seems to me that charter schools have provided a place for, for conservatives, moderates, and liberals at least to come to some kind of communion on what to do. And in New Orleans, we have kind of walked that path. We have, not, we have decided not to fight the voucher fight because it's just fraught with complications and people can't seem to come but to But not everybody's come to the communion because in some ways you could only do it because the union got blown That's away true. by the storm and now you got to face the fact. I'm talking about New Orleans. It. We've come to communion on that. I, 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 think that, I think that if you get into the old unionized, centralized system versus no, we're going to give the archbishop as many vouchers as he needs, right, irrespective of how many slots he has, I think people are arguing about maybe what would fix 10% of the problem. My, my theory of governing is a little bit different. If you can come up with an agreement, 66 and two thirds, drive that, ride that horse as far as you can ride it, and don't fight about the other stuff right now. That doesn't mean that people might not be right or, or their theories about those things might not be right, but I'd rather spend my time focused on the things that most but of us agree on. But do you think on. you need to keep the union from coming back? I think, I think that the way it was structured before and how it was controlled was not good because I think the union, as it relates to education, Got, got unfocused on uh, results for kids. They got more concerned about benefits. Um, and I think a lot of people, in a lot of these fights, it gets to be about power than, than, it, than it does about achievement of the students. If you stay focused on the student and the student only, that could take you to a place where there could be a comfortable relationship between the union and the, and the private sector, or, or it couldn't. 
Um, but in New Orleans, I can tell you that we had a centralized bureaucracy that was corrupt. We had a teachers union that was more concerned about gale pay and tenure and a whole bunch of other stuff and not student outcomes. And, and I think the fact that it got blown up. Now, 7,000 people lost their jobs. This is not an inconsequential moment. And there is, a, there is a whole bunch of stuff relating to race and class and generational things that need to be dealt with in a, in a better way than just saying you got a pink slip in two weeks. And I think that you see this disconnect between young TFA kids and the older um, teachers that used to be there a long time. There's a cultural disconnect that exists there. But putting that aside, staying focused on the big thing, I think the process of governing that we have now is better than the one that went. You talked about before. healthcare a moment ago. Uh, didn't you do a more decentralized model of healthcare? Yes, so before Katrina hit, um, we had this building that's still there. It was built by Huey Long. It's a gorgeous structure called Charity Hospital. Uh, it was built in the 1930s and 40s. For those of you that have seen the state capitol, it looks very much like that. It's a gorgeous building, got it, but it got beat to hell. Um, before it got beat to hell, what we had in Louisiana were no primary health clinics. Um, generally, the people that did not have insurance got to go to charity. They couldn't turn them away. But for the most part, you, you got triaged into the emergency room. So you'd go in and your baby would have a toothache or a cold or your heart would be, you know, beating the wrong way. You would sit there for 13, 14, 15, 16 hours while they pushed you aside waiting for the gunshot victims to come in. Very centralized, very bureaucratic. So that building got kind of torn apart. And what we started to do is something that I think is really going to transform the city forever, is we began to try to visualize, again, not healthcare as it was, but what's it going to look like in the future. And so we're in the process of right now doing something really extraordinary. We're building two medical centers. One of them is being built by the federal government, the Veterans Administration. It's their first new state-of-the-art, LEED Gold certified hospital in the country, in the Gulf South. It's a billion and a half, two billion dollar project. And it's being built across the street from and in conjunction with the University Medical Center, which is, without getting into any fights, a partnership between Tulane LSU and a whole bunch of other people that don't like each other too much. Boy, but, is it a partnership? Learning, but are learning how to love each other. All right. So putting that aside, putting that aside, we're gonna have a medical center that is gonna not do what the old medical center did. But it's going to do four things. It's going to do patient care for indigents. It's going to train kids how to be great doctors so they can take care of people in New Orleans. It is going to put us in a really competitive, uh, advantageous position as it relates to federal funding so that we can do research on, and we only want to do it on a couple of things because it's the next thing that's going to be most important. I had to learn how to spell this and I had to write it down, but it's called quaternary care. Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. That means really high-end stuff, brains, genetics, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we want to do is now take that research that we're doing and begin to add value. Here's another big thing we learned. Add value to intellectual capital and manufacture it in New Orleans. What we were in Louisiana was a poor state. Alan Greenspan wrote about this in his book. A lot of natural resources like a third world country let people extract our stuff. Oil and gas, right? Somewhere else they're going to make stuff out of it, send it back to us, and we have to buy it. Right, went in Marcellus, Harry Connick, leaving, going up, building Lincoln Center, $800 million building, 3,000 jobs. That guy, that, that intellectual and creative capital came. And then out of Tulane, Tulane has more patents than most other uh, higher education institutions. They used to take their applied research, send it someplace else, right? And somebody would make something out of it. Mm -hmm. And so what we've decided to do is kind of reverse that take the intellectual capital that's coming out of those medical centers, about 12,000 jobs will be there, and then begin to become a high-end knowledge base. Well, what about going to the medicine. doctor? Exactly. So then, then as that's the central piece. The next piece was, well, what happens before you get to the emergency room? We said, no, we don't want you to do that anymore. What we want to do is put clinics in your neighborhoods. So for those of you that are political people like I am, everybody used to go eat at a place called Ruth Chris Steakhouse. Ruth Fortell, everybody, Ruth, William, yeah. thank you for that. Give a the shout original, out. Huh? The original. The original Ruth Chris Steakhouse. That is now a state-of-the-art primary health care clinic. On nutrition, How too. about that? On nutrition. I remember you understand? them beating the this butter is, into that steak. There's something poetic <laughs> about this, because you'd go in there and get a big slab of, of meat with a lot of butter and juice, and you'd stroke out eating a thing. All right? So right now, that building, which is on Arlene's Avenue and Broad, yeah. has turned into one of the 88 primary health care clinics. Another one is immediately adjacent to what used to be known as the St. Thomas Health Clinic, 
where, one, where the health clinic used to be in one of the buildings that was in um, the, the housing project. We've now taken that out. We, we bought O.J. Hooters, which was a big old place on the corner that used to sell uh, all kinds of old furniture and has now turned it into a state-of-the-art clinic, and I mentioned this this morning. 350 women a month now go into that place and have mammograms, poor women. And, and in, in Louisiana, we have the highest mortality rate from cancer in the nation. Not the highest incident, but mortality rate. And that just means people aren't getting there fast enough. So now we have these ADA primary health care clinics. So the greatest fear, and the reason I spoke out this morning about health care, is now that those clinics are in place and it's being funded by the mechanism in the, in the, in the Affordable Health Care Act, if that mechanism goes away, those clinics very well could close. All of that pressure will then move back into the university medical center, and that's going to be problematic. So health care is very unclear for all of us. I don't really think that we know what the unintended consequences of what's going to happen. But we, we're, anytime anybody breathes around health care, we get nervous because of the, the physical pieces that we're building. And we started to build them after Katrina when the Affordable Health Care Act was kind of in play. If that changes, a lot of stuff will change on the ground in New Orleans. So we're watching it very carefully. I'm going to just give one personal interjection which is I covered his father, Moon Landrieu, when I was at the uh, State's Item Times Picayune. And we used to meet after city council meetings at that Ruth's Chris's Steakhouse in the back room. And at one point, and, but he let reporters in and the city council, Joe DeRosa, nice would all be there. Uh, but we were sued under the Open and Government <laughs> Act that they wanted to videotape our lunches at Ruth's Chris's Steakhouse. Well, well we imagine wanted. the man meeting with a quorum of the city council and a bunch of reporters over dinner that somebody else was buying. Yep, that's what we used to do. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> that's, that's how I But got as my it. father reminds me, you know, times have changed. Yeah. <laughs> Expectations have changed. I can't hardly meet with one or two council members without somebody wanting to come sit in a room. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, sure. then we'll open it up. You mentioned earlier on about sort of the cultural uh, economy that came along. And I sometimes say about New Orleans, we have four or five pillars of the economy, the extraction industry, you yep. talk about the port of New Orleans, you know, tourism, a new entrepreneurship thing. But also, culture is actually an economic yeah. uh, Sector. Let me let me run through that just to, just to highlight that. First of all, New Orleans, like everywhere else, knows that it can't survive uh, as a one-trick pony. So we were terrible at tourism in the 1960s, but we decided to get good at it, and we worked really hard. And now we're an international competitor in tourism. We've done more major sports or entertainment events from the BCS Championship to the Jazz Fest, Essence Fest, Super you know, Bowl. Super Bowl. You know, the NBA All Star Games coming up than any city in America, and we're really good at that. And we're proud of the fact that we're good at it. But a long time ago, we said, we got to do more. And so we got into the medical field. So I told you already about the 12,000 jobs that are coming out of medicine. Oil and gas, you know, kind of went to Houston for a while. Shell stuck with us, as did Chevron. And then a lot of the independents, Phyllis, you know this better than anybody else, stuck in New Orleans. And so there's a nice, really, hub in the oil and gas industry and the port. So we have four of the largest ports in the world that's kind of right in and around New Orleans. Most of the things that come in and out of the country come through our port. Those things are important. We also, by the way, and I didn't want to tell the mayor of Los Angeles this when he was sitting next to me, but I'll say this now. <laughs> we, have, we have, because of our film tax credit program, which is the most aggressive in the country, become the third largest producer of major motion pictures um, in America, only behind Los Angeles and New York. We did a $500 million book of business last year, 37 major motion pictures. We have nine that are being filmed there right now. We've created 7,000 jobs because we thought about this as a business. Now, in back in the day, um, what's that movie, Love Story? Who, Ali McGraw was in Love Story, right? And her husband was a guy named Evans, uh, who was one of the biggest producers in Hollywood. Robert Evans. Yeah, yeah, Robert Evans, thank you. They used to come in and kind of sell everybody on, we're going to make New Orleans a Hollywood place. We'll make a really good movie about Cajuns. <laughs> and they'd come in, and they'd come in with this, some dumbass theme. Excuse me, William. <laughs> And then have flamethrowers in Jackson Square, and it'll be a really bad movie about New Orleans with bad accents. And they would only make New Orleans that were New Orleans themed. Well, a lot of us who kind of understood a little bit more about the industry said, well, let me explain what a soundstage is to you. That if you just build a box, smart people that are creative can put anything in the box you want and make it look like we're in Taipan mm -hmm. or wherever y'all want to be. So we got into the business of business creation treating it just like you would treat the oil and gas industry or any other industry, tax incentives. We started thinking about how you trained people to be in this industry, and as a result of the business approach to it, 
right? We said, we don't care what kind of product you produce. We're gonna, if you produce a job and we allow you to make money, you're gonna produce something good. And that's how part of that came out. Now that's part of what I call the creative economy and what's called the cultural economy. Now, think about this, a truck driver, boys, you got truck drivers in, in, in your business. Truck drivers don't care what they're hauling. They can haul steel for Boise or they can haul lights for Bob Evans. They're truckers, they move stuff. Electricians can kind of hook up a weld for him or they can hook up you know, a light or a sound stage for somebody else. So these jobs are immediately transferable. And what we started telling people that in Louisiana, the business side of culture is a huge economic sector in and of itself. Now most of y'all don't even think about this because you walk by these people all the time. But take a minute today when you're walking around Aspen, all the folks that are driving the cars, all the people that are working in the shops, all the folks that are feeding the food. What about the chefs? I know you had John Currens came here. John Currens is a little guy from New Orleans, went over right where Ole Miss is, opened up four restaurants, and now he employs like 300 people, right? John Fultz, one of our chefs, started cooking, you know, and all of a sudden he decided to become a distributor. He distributes millions of pounds of food to everybody in the world. Then he opened up a restaurant. Last week he opened up a restaurant that cost him $6 million to invest in. He employs 350 people. He did it with Rick Tremonto. It's called Revolution. It's gonna be one of the finest restaurants in the country. When you begin to see it as a sector, and you add up all the jobs that are attendant to these things, art, music, historic preservation, architecture, food, forget about hotels and all that stuff, and you start to count it, in Louisiana, you get to 144,000 jobs and a $9 billion economy. It's 12% of Louisiana's economy. And let me tell you something, in every state in America, you have, you have this, if you count it and if you nurture it, but you have to nurture it just like you nurture any other business. See, mostly we think art and culture is just a lost leader. If you've got a good symphony, maybe it's gonna really kind of incent one of you that owns a big company to move your company there so that your employees can go someplace, you know, and be edified by the beautiful culture and music. And that's a nice way to do it, but it is in and of itself an end to create a job through culture. And everybody wants it, everybody has it, and it produces great value and it gives you great richness and authenticity. In the city of New Orleans, we like to think, you know, we have more of this. I will say two things about it on the negative side. Obviously, Nashville and Austin figured out a way to monetize music. They really are not the music capitals of the world. They act like it. Truly, New Orleans is the music capital of the world. <laughs> but they found a way to make a lot more money out of it and make people think that they have more of it than we do, and they don't. And from the business side, they did a much better job, and New Orleans can learn from them as well. Any questions, thoughts? Yes, Gloria. She doesn't need a microphone. Yeah, no, glory. Right about that. Um, Mitch, can you talk a little bit about the power of the region? I mean, from Galveston over to the Florida Panhandle and New Orleans' role in, you know, really helping blow out sort of America's Gulf Coast. Yeah, that's a, that's a, of course we come to this, uh, unfortunately, through tragedy. So we had Katrina, then we had the BP oil spill. So all of a sudden, everybody on the Gulf Coast is feeling at risk. And we had to find a way to communicate to Congress that we're important. And, uh, and unfortunately, there's nothing like, you know, a catastrophic event to pull people together and to make people understand how important each of them are. So Houston, right? Lake Charles, Lafayette, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, you go over to Mobile, and then you jump across, you know, the Florida Panhandle. We all are at catastrophic risk for um, rising sea levels, right, and a whole bunch of other stuff from bigger, faster, bigger, slower, and more powerful storms coming our way. Also, the BP oil spill made us feel a lot more vulnerable than we thought we were, and so we're dancing through that relationship between the private sector and the government, how much is too much regulation, how much is not enough, what does it take to make us safe, and then all of us have the common threat of our coastline deteriorating. Now, the Florida Everglades was much more well-known to everybody before we started talking about restoring the coast in Louisiana, but I think people now know, and I think this is the reason why I was invited here, that we lost 2,300 square miles of land since 1930, mm -hmm. right? The, the size of the state of Delaware, and if we don't do something to replenish that, then we have a problem. Now, on top of that, bad stuff, what, what has been interesting to watch over time in the last 20 years is how major manufacturers have found the South a much more hospitable place to do business, primarily manufacturing cars, you know, and, and other things. And how the South people have started to look at it not as a backwater anymore, 
not as something that the rest of the country just kind of, you know, snide at, but actually started thinking, you know, they kind of got it going on mm -hmm. and they're producing great value. I think in East Parker was talking about the great value that Houston is producing. I think New Orleans is going to step up to the plate. Atlanta certainly is one of the great places in America to do business. They have a great man there named Kasim mm -hmm. Reed. And I think people are kind of waking up to the fact that we're not just laying back anymore and waiting for people to come to us, that we're going to take well, it to well, them. To stick on the Gulf Coast, which Gloria asked about, coastal restoration, I'm going to embarrass us slightly, but maybe we get the microphone to uh, Lisa Jackson, who's the head of the U.S. Environmental Protection. there she is. The EPA and President's Cabinet. But Lisa, for those of you who don't know, is a Tulane University Engineering School graduate, yay, even if she went to Princeton to <laughs> polish it off a bit. And, uh, but you've been in charge of figuring out what to do with the BP oil spill money and the coastal restoration for the entire Gulf Coast to think it through, right, Lisa? So, yeah. Sorry to give people my back. Hi, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks, Walter. Good to see everybody. Hey, Cheryl. Um, yeah, just a couple things on the Gulf Coast. I like to say that the one thing about the BP spill was that it was a moment where the country lost the Gulf of Mexico for weeks and then months, and there was this indefinite period of time where the Gulf was lost to us. And I love the phrase that Gloria used, America's Gulf Coast, because it really is our third coast. We don't think about it often enough. So there are some things that have come out of it that I think are very po uh, positive. Um, I led for the president a task force whose job was to envision what it would take to restore the coast, not to make it back the way it was in 1930, uh, as Mitch said, but to make it uh, better and stronger and more resilient. And what we decided was we had to focus on water quality, because many of you know we have a huge dead zone of water quality just off much of the Gulf Coast. We had to focus on making resilient communities, making sure that our people felt comfortable and safe investing uh, in, in the growth of those communities. Restoring habitat, which includes restoring uh, wetlands as well. And um, all of those things are in a wonderful report, and reports are great, but it needs money. And I think uh, what happened this week is that uh, Senator Landrieu and others in the... Uh, Senator Landrieu being Mary Landrieu, his... Being uh, his sister. Sister. Yeah. Uh, shepherded something called the Restore Act, which is an acronym in Washington, but it is what it sounds like. It's money. It, it makes good on what the president said way back during the spill, which is the majority of the fines that are assessed against BP should go back to the region to help make it better and stronger. That passed as an a, amendment, as a piece of the transportation bill, and I believe the president signed it yesterday. Um, I have a blog about it that I think is up on the White House website. It's an important milestone. I have to give one other nod to Louisiana. Louisiana has put together a coastal uh, uh, commission, had it for a long time. Other states have it to a degree, but they have a $50 billion plan to restore the coast. $50 billion is a lot of money. Um, when we talk about fines from BP, we talk about you know, five to $20 billion in range. So we're not gonna get it all together, but talk about recognizing that you cannot have a strong Gulf Coast region if we don't start to put in place thinking about how to manage the Mississippi River to reduce pollution, to make sure we're not killing our wetlands, drowning them at the same time as we're trying to build them back. So it's an important moment. We now have to get the settlement with BP, get the money, but we also have to make sure that we continue to empower the kind of forward thinking that leads people to put those kind of plans into place. First of all, it was a, I'm glad it happened and it was great and everybody's to be applauded for their work. I would say, again, that Katrina didn't cause uh, all of our problems, and BP didn't. It accelerated a lot of them. And $50 billion does sound like a lot of money, but you know what, it's really not enough. Because the damage is far greater than that and has been lasting a long time. So I'm not trying to be ungrateful, but we, 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 we fought these two wars. Let me just make this point. And whenever the nation is at risk, we rise and do whatever it is that's necessary, and money really is not an option. Right? And so they teach you a lesson. If we as a collective people think something's important enough, we're going to find a way to fix it, even through our political dysfunction that we seem to have you know, from time to time. This, the big message about the coast is that it's, it's of critical importance to the nation's economic security and national security, not just because you like to eat seafood. And most of your seafood comes from there, too, and it provides a lot of jobs. But I want you to think about um, when we had the discussion the other day about energy independence and is, is America going to be energy independent or are we going to be energy secure? Well, in order to do that, 
whatever we can extract and you know in an environmentally safe way that works for businesses and all the that different stuff we have to be able to do that well if that coast goes away that coast protects the pipelines that the oil and gas runs through that gets to everybody else in the country and if those pipelines are not protected they're going to get destroyed by the storms that now we know we can't stop storms and if we want to fortify ourselves and make ourselves resilient the coast is the first level of defense that protects our economic security right because of all the jobs attached to it and our national security because of our energy independence also if that coast is not restored the city of new orleans as you know it will disappear in a hundred years the city of new orleans will not be there physically will not be there unless we want to kind of move to category six hurricane protection which takes you from a 14 billion dollar piece that we just finished to get to category three but to get to category five or category six that's another 30 or 40 you know billion dollars so it's an economic argument to national security argument. we're not we do not believe that the nation has accepted that as a national imperative. If they would, they would pass the legislation that really matters, which is called the Fair Share Act. And the Fair Share Act is really kind of easy to understand. If you're in any other place in America except Louisiana, and you have some natural resource that comes out of your land, and money goes to Washington, you get 45 or 50 cents back. And then you can do with it what you want, which is mostly to restore what it is that you broke up by taking it out of the ground. Huey Long or somebody back in the day cut a really bad deal because he was being obstinate. And the deal in Louisiana is 95 cents for the federal government, 5 cents for Louisiana. And if they would just equalize that off, there would be a revenue stream being created by the thing, right, that's actually causing the problem that would then go back in in partnership with the private sector and be able to re rebuild the coast. But in politics, now, Professor Arnstein, I did learn this, I think, the first day. All right? If someone's got something already, it's really hard to take it from them. <laughs> Right? And they got, they got, somebody's got that pot of money and they don't want to give it away. I, I was pretty good this first day, <laughs> one on one. Anyway, thank you very much, Mitch Landrew. Right,